is a video for a review of the heart. Now, um, I'm going to start off with a lot of the external structures on the heart, and then I'll open the heart up and then move to some of the internal things. Now, first and foremost, this heart, you're viewing it um, from an anterior view, so this is the front of the heart, which would mean that if this was the front of the heart, that uh, this location here would actually be a sulcus. So it's not those red things or blue things, but the actual indentation here is a sulcus. The word sulcus refers to a valley. So there's a, there's a valley that's located here, and there are blood vessels located in this valley. Now this valley is known as the uh, anterior interventricular sulcus. Anterior, because this is the front of the heart, Inter, which means in between, ventricular, which means ventricles. So this ventricle here is the left ventricle, and this ventricle here is the right ventricle. So anterior interventricular sulcus, the valley in between the two ventricles. Here we can see the pulmonary trunk, and the pulmonary trunk is taking deoxygenated blood from the right side of the heart, to the lungs. So blood travels through the pulmonary trunk and then through the pulmonary arteries. These pulmonary arteries are your left pulmonary arteries which are taking deoxygenated blood to the left lung. If I rotate this heart model around slowly so you can see where I'm going, there is that same group or pair of pulmonary arteries going to the left lung and here are a pair of pulmonary arteries going to the right lungs. So this pulmonary trunk splits into these pulmonary arteries and they take blood to the lungs so that they can be uh, so that they can actually make a, a gas exchange at the lungs. Carbon dioxide is going to leave this blood and enter into the alveoli of the lungs while oxygen is going to diffuse from the alveoli in the lungs into the blood. And then once that blood comes into contact with oxygen and is oxygenated, it turns red. Henceforth, the red colored pulmonary veins that you see in the back, these are two pulmonary veins, or three I should say, here are two here, here's a third on that side, so these would be the left pulmonary veins returning from the left lung and then you can see these two pulmonary veins coming from the right side returning from the right lung bringing oxygenated blood. That oxygenated blood would then enter into this left atrium and the blood would then pass from the left atrium to the left ventricle and then it would pass through the aorta so it would actually ascend through the ascending aorta to loop over the aortic arch and then make a bend to descend through the descending aorta. Last but not least over here are our vena cava. This is the superior vena cava and underneath the heart you can see this outcropping there, that is going to be the inferior vena cava. Now, I know you're looking at this and you're like, okay, that makes sense that the superior vena cava is a really large vein, but I thought the inferior vena cava would be a large vein. Well, it is. This model does not include the rest of the inferior vena cava because the heart is sitting just above the diaphragm, and the inferior vena cava actually passes through the diaphragm and into the abdominal cavity or it actually arises from the abdominal cavity uh, through the diaphragm to the heart. So they would actually have to include all of that in order for you to be able to see. Also located here, this little white structure is the ligamentum arteria, uh, is the ligamentum arteriosum. And the ligamentum arteriosum is a small ligament that pins down your aorta to the top of your pulmonary trunk 
to keep the aorta from just you know randomly flying all over the place when the heart contracts and pumps blood into the aorta. And we can remove the aorta and the pulmonary trunk and the pulmonary arteries and then you can see the semilunar valves. So here's the pulmonary semilunar valve. There's the aortic semilunar valve. These valves are what make sure to, that uh, blood doesn't go backwards after it leaves the heart. So blood exits the right ventricle and passes through the pulmonary semilunar valve. And uh, when blood tries to come back in from the pulmonary trunk back into the heart, it will actually push the the blood returning will actually push these cuffs closed. And so that's how the valve actually closes. And the same thing happens here at the aorta. Blood is forced through the aortic semilunar valves, and then when blood tries to come back from through the aorta, it gets caught in these cuffs, and then it shuts that valve. Also, at the base of the aorta, you can see the coronary arteries. You only have two. And these two arteries are responsible for delivering blood to the entire heart. So um, you've got to take care of your blood vessels because you've only got two arteries that are responsible for branching out and delivering blood all over the place. So you've got your uh, left and you've got your right coronary arteries. And I know you might be looking at this and you're like, doesn't he have his right and his left mixed up? No, you got to remember, it's never your left and your right, but the left and the right of the patient, not you. Also, we can see here are auricles. These auricles are pads of fat located on the surface of your heart. This would be the left auricle and that would be the right auricle. Now, if we continue exploring, we'll take this top part off. We'll see how good I am with one hand, because usually it takes two hands to take this particular one off. Because this model still kind of new, still fresh. You can see all four of the chambers here. We can see the right atrium, the left atrium, the left, uh, excuse me, the right ventricle, and the left ventricle all four spaces together. So we know that here's the uh, here's half of our superior vena cava. Deoxygenated blood enters into this right atrium. And for those of you who have a lab manual, I think there's an image that looks almost like this. And it shows a, a shot from this angle. And so blood enters in here and then you can see this indentation located right in there. That indentation is actually called the fossa ovalis. That thing used to be a foramen ovalis, but when you're a fetus inside your mom, it's a foramen ovalis because the blood actually enters into the right atrium and then passes through the foramen ovalis into the left atrium and then passes through the left side of the heart and is actually delivered as oxygenated blood throughout your body. It does that because you're not using your lungs when you're a fetus. Your fetal hemoglobin has a high affinity for oxygen and it actually snatches the oxygen off of the hemoglobin of your mom. But once you're born, you don't do that anymore and you start using your lungs. And so this hole seals, there's a flap there, the flap closes and it begins to seal itself and it becomes just an indentation known as the fossa ovalis. Here we see this hole. This hole is actually the opening to the coronary sinus, the blood that the heart actually uses because all of the blood that you see passing through here, the heart's not actually using that blood. The heart is just transporting that blood. But the blood that the heart gets to actually use that came from those coronary arteries, remember that? Remember the coronary arteries right there, left and right? Well, those guys, once that blood is delivered to the heart, the heart uses the oxygen out of that blood, and then that deoxygenated blood is then returned to something called a coronary sinus, and the exit for that coronary sinus is here at this hole, and that blood ends up here in the right atrium, and then it passes through this bicuspid valve, and, uh, and passes through the bicuspid valve and then into the right ventricle. So here you can see the bicuspid valve. These little strings are chordae tendinae. 
Chordae meaning cord, tendon A talking about tendons. So they work like drawstrings to help with the opening and closing of the uh, tricuspid valve. And then this pink little structure here is actually a papillary muscle. And if you look closely, this is the papillary muscle and you can see the chordae tendine, which are attached to that muscle. Over on this side, we can see the left atrium, we can see the bicuspid valve, and we can see the left ventricle. One of the last things here are the walls, the septum. This is an interventricular septum, and this is an interatrial septum. The interatrial septum, inter meaning in between, atria, atrial referring to the atria, septum referring to wall. Interventricular septum, inter in between, ventricular, the ventricles, septum, wall. So this is the wall in between the ventricles, this is the wall between the atria. Last but not least, if we flip this over, some students get a chance to learn about the blood vessels on the posterior side of the heart. This blue vein is known as the small cardiac vein, while this vein in the very middle of the posterior side of the heart is the middle cardiac vein, making this blue structure, this vein, the posterior cardiac vein, and this structure here, the great cardiac vein. And so when the small, the middle, the posterior, and the great cardiac veins all merge, they become the coronary sinus. And that coronary sinus is what takes all that deoxygenated blood and brings it back into the right atrium here. And that's all we have time for. 12 minutes. We'll see you. Peace.